I always tell somebody, I'll say, hey, I'm Jeff. And they'll look at me like, okay. And then you say, well, I'm the master distiller from Jack Daniels. And they're like, holy crap, can I get an autograph? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Can I get a selfie? This episode of Bourbon Pursuit is made possible through listeners like you, supported through Patreon, and with partnerships brought to you by the following. For this year's Father's Day, do you want to do something different beyond a new tie? How about giving Dad his own personal tobacconist with a good cigar company subscription? Or heck, maybe you just need a good gift for yourself. The Good Cigar Company designed the first ready-to-go kit with everything you need to light up, all in a handsome pack that even acts as its own humidor. Go to goodcigar.co and use promo code BOURBON for 10% off any subscription and start enjoying your bourbon with new cigars from the Good Cigar Company. Sterling Cut Glass is the official whiskey and tasting glass supplier to distilleries across the country and is also the official glassware of Bourbon Pursuit. They are offering free etched samples to whiskey societies nationwide. Simply email spirits at sterlingcutglass.com, include your logo, and mention Bourbon Pursuit. Take a look at their online catalog with Glen Cairns, Copitas, Rock Glasses, Decanters, and more at burnpursuit.com and click on the banner for Sterling Cut Glass. Hey everyone, welcome back to another brand new episode of Bourbon Pursuit, but let's hit some news first. Bourbon Affair, the Kentucky Bourbon Affair, it's the fantasy camp for bourbon lovers, is going to be taking place June 5th through the 10th in Louisville, Kentucky. It's a place where you can have intimate dinners and events with master distillers all across the industry from Jim Beam, Maker's Mark, Four Roses, you name it, all the big dogs in the Kentucky Bourbon Trail, and even some smaller ones too. They're going to be there and they've got all the events listed out. We're going to be there and we're going to be recording some sessions that will be taking place during the Higher Proof Expo. And these are going to be some good sessions. And we're glad that we're allowing the opportunity to be able to record these so we can bring them out to our fans and bring them to our masses. However, they're not going to be released for quite some time. So you need to be there in person. And not only that is we can't record all of them. We're only going to record four of the total 16 or 20. So you've got to be there in person. There's a lot of great things that you can see make sure you go to kybourbonaffair.com you can see all the events buy your tickets and make your way to louisville june 5th through the 10th we've grown a lot in regards of our social media presence i was very happy when i looked at facebook just the other day and we just passed 3500 fans that's awesome and instagram just passed 8500 i mean we're blowing up and you have to make sure that you follow us on all these different places because we're posting anything that we're doing from the recording sites from what we're drinking on a Friday or Saturday or maybe a Tuesday afternoon. We're doing all those kinds of things. You know, we're, we're looking at posting whisk reviews and all the links to all the new show sponsors as well. Those are gonna be coming through our social. So make sure you go check that out. This week, we did pick our latest barrel, which is going to be a 14 year straight bourbon whiskey coming from Barrel Bourbon. So you can expect a podcast featuring Joe and the other folks at Barrel so you can get really excited about this Barrel Pick in the upcoming weeks. And again, Barrel Picks are only available to Patreon supporters, so make sure you go support us on Patreon and you get access to those Barrel Picks. Now, today's show is what we would call a continual beating of a dead horse. It is something where we have seen it all the time on whether they're Facebook forms or whether they're on Google links, and it's always the question is, is Jack Daniels a bourbon? Well, I hate to be a spoiler alert, but who knows if we actually come away with an answer at the end of today, because there is um, legalities, there's process, Lincoln County processes, and there's just mindset. It is something a bourbon before it goes into something else. Um, you know, if you're gonna finish a port whiskey and some, or finish a bourbon in a port barrel, is it still considered bourbon, right? These are the things that you have to think about of what still consti you know, constitutes a bourbon at the end of the day when it's done with its actual legal process. So this is going to be a fun episode and we get to hear it from the horse's mouth, Jeff Arnett, the master distiller of Jack Daniels. So we got a big dog on the show today to finally lead us down this path. 
So make sure you enjoy that. Make sure you're also helping support the show on Patreon. As I'd mentioned, we've got our barrel bourbon pick. We've got our Willet pick coming. We've got bottle totes, patches, t-shirts, koozies, and more. And I'm also thinking about doing some little bit extra, maybe some leather coasters, maybe some other etched glassware uh, from our, our new sponsor that we have on here. So we'll, we'll kind of think of some new things that we can we can get in there. But as I'd mentioned, you know, we're blowing up on social media. So make sure you're following us there, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And you can get, you know, actually you can follow us. You can see what we're doing. And make sure you tag us in your post too. We love seeing what our fans are up to. And we love seeing what you guys are drinking as well. And make sure you subscribe to us on iTunes or wherever you get your podcast. And you can also check out the video podcast on YouTube and Facebook. And as always, if you want to get all these new podcast be straight to your inbox go to birdpursuit.com click on the email button and you're going to get these beams straight to your inbox every thursday morning at 7 a.m when they are released so i was getting ready to kick off the show and i got to starting to record and cut this and i realized holy crap this is episode 150 we've done 150 episodes of bourbon pursuit i'm i'm totally floored i want to say thank you everyone that has been listening to this show that has made it as successful as it is. Uh, all our Patreon supporters, you're the, the biggest help to this, honestly and truly. Thank you so much for helping support this show. And, you know, everyone just keep continuing to listen. Make sure those iTunes reviews keep coming in. I mean, that's really what helps this. That's what helps us make us the official podcast of Bourbon, the best podcast out there as well. So, again, thank you, everybody, for the loyal support. And with that, enjoy this week's episode. Welcome back to the episode of the Bourbon Pursuit Podcast, the official podcast of bourbon. Today is going to create the uh, the ever ongoing argument that we see on all the bourbon community forums. It's it seems that it's it, you know what it's been going on for yeah. years now, right? It's border wars, you know, like Kentucky versus Tennessee. You know, it's it it goes deep to our core. It, with me, it all began with Tennessee football. But you know, <laughs> when you a, see those those, <laughs> those <laughs> orange jerseys come on the field, and you're like, oh, God, yeah. yeah. And you hear Rocky Top a million times because I went to a Tennessee game and Kentucky played them, and we suck, obviously. And Tennessee does some good every play, and it's like Rocky Top, Rocky Top, Rocky Top, and you're like, <laughs> I can't take this anymore. And so <laughs> it's either that or like the Florida Seminoles, like the karate or the chop or whatever. Yeah, you, you kind of get sick of it after a while. Yeah. You know, for me, I think it was, and we'll kind of talk about this as well, is, you know, when you start getting a bourbon and people are, you know, they, they either hand you a bottle of Jack Daniels yeah. or you hear the things that says like, oh, my dad won't talk to me because I brought a bottle of Jack Daniels yeah. to Christmas or something. Right. And it's like, you know, I, I, it, it, it's always the age long thing of is Jack Daniels a bourbon? I know. And I, I don't really even know. I've always just been so close minded to it because of the Kentucky, Tennessee thing, but I'm, I'm excited to like, you know, kind of bring a peace coalition, you know, between us two and, uh, <laughs> and, and is Jack Daniels a bourbon. I know. And that's what I, I it, it's truly, what we're going to try to find out today. So today on the show, we have Jeff Arnett. Uh, this is just Jeff. Apparently he just likes to be called <laughs> Jeff, but he is the master distiller at Jack Daniels distillery. So Jeff, welcome to the show. Hey, well, Thank you. Thank you for having me on today. I appreciate the opportunity. You got it. So I guess the uh, the first part we want to start off with is kind of how did you get into this business, right? You know, before we get into, you know, everything about Jack being a bourbon or not being a bourbon and uh, processes and maple charcoal, like I want to just talk about you first. So kind of talk about where you kind of either, you know, did you grow up around it? Did you just, you like drinking and you said, this is a good path for me. What was, what was your idea? You know, I, I grew up uh, over in West Tennessee, about halfway between Memphis and Nashville in a town called Jackson. And I actually went away to college thinking I would work in the automotive field. That was my first interest. But uh, my home, my hometown of Jackson is where Procter & Gamble had put the Pringles potato chip plant. And it was the largest industrial employer in my hometown. So when I was graduating from college, I couldn't find work in the automotive field. So I decided to, to call on Procter & Gamble. And at the time, they didn't have openings at Pringles. But if they they told me if I was interested in working for them, that the interview would be in New Orleans at the Folger Coffee Company. So I drove down and took an interview there and worked for four and a half years at the Folger plant. Uh, it was there that I learned the sensory sciences, 
because the, the New Orleans plant for Folgers is, was very close to the port of New Orleans. It was where the commodities market for coffees existed. So we would bring in small quantities of beans uh, from all the different countries that grow them. And I would sit with the old coffee masters from time to time and I would learn how to class and grade coffee beans on flavor, acidity and body and all these different attributes that you want to consider as you would think about blending them to be more complete and more complex. And of course, hopefully better together than they were individually. Uh, so I was there for, like I said, about four and a half years in New Orleans. And then I moved out to Texas to a sister coffee plant that decaffeinated coffee beans. Uh, but it had also been an orange juice plant and been converted to do juice drinks. So I was out there a couple of years and then I moved back to my hometown of Jackson, Tennessee, and then I, I was making Pringles. But PNG decided to divest all of its food brands. Uh, but I was a huge fan of Jack Daniels. Uh, I was in the Tennessee Squires Association. Uh, I saw a job posting that sounded very similar to what I had done in my background and decided to, to float a resume on it. And it just so happened that it was for the quality control manager's job at the Jack Daniel Distillery, which I think if you would talk to most Tennessee squires, they would tell you that their dream job would be to quit whatever they do today, move to Lynchburg and, and work here at the distillery somewhere. So I was, I was happy just to be able to do that. Um, but as a quality control manager here, I worked under the previous master distiller for seven years. Uh, and it was in that job that I literally learned how to take water and grains and yeast, ferment it, distill it, charcoal, mellow it, mature it in a barrel, and then ultimately years later, get it in a bottle, making sure every label was straight and every cap was tight. Uh, and I even answered consumer comments for Jack Daniels directly for five years. Uh, so that was my background. Um, like I said, I'm a native Tennessee and I was a huge fan of Jack Daniels. Got my start here as a quality control manager and that has now been about 16 years ago. So you came in through kind of a, a mentorship as well. And, and yeah, I guess you could say, you know, uh, you're, you basically learned your along the way. I have, you know, and there were different things that I had done uh, in my background that I think were helpful. Uh, but there's nothing much better than I think learning how to make whiskey from people that have been making it for as long as the people here in Lynchburg have. So many of the people that I work with even today are the people who taught me what I know. Uh, they're, they're the true experts and they've learned how to make whiskey from their parents and grandparents because when you grow up in Lynchburg, there's not much else to do. <laughs> <laughs> make, make lemonade, Lynchburg lemonade. Yeah, you can, well, you know, I guess you could work for the highway department. We do have one of those, but you know, or sell t-shirts on the square. But if you grow up in Lynchburg, uh, most people kind of set their sights. If they're not, if they're going to stay in town and want to live in the area, uh, the distillery is by far the best work you're going to find. Uh, it's, it's a great place to work, a great group of people to work with. Um, I absolutely love coming into work every morning. Uh, it's sort of a pastoral setting. I've always been in a cinder block box. It didn't have any windows, um, you know, when it, when it came to manufacturing, because I didn't want you to know if it was day or night. They tried to kind of factor out all of the uh, external factors uh, so you could run 24 seven. But here you, you look out and you see tourists walk by, you see it snow, rain, sunny days, watch the, the ducks and the turkeys around the property. It's just it's an awesome place to work. And I have to kind of pinch myself a lot of days when I drive in because I just I feel very fortunate to be here. Well, good. So one more question about your your past. Since you had so much experience at the Pringles company, I mean, is it true that the only reason they started is because they they ran across a bunch of case of old tennis ball holders and they just said that's that looks good. Put the tennis ball on them. <laughs> because once you pop, you can't stop. <laughs> you know, I think you know P and G P and G would would often see a need. Uh, in the marketplace wouldn't wouldn't necessarily always execute the best idea against it, but they they at least would try. You know, one of the things that the Texas plant that I worked at did was this was the, the before the days of the Keurig machines and the K cups. Uh, Procter and Gamble created a thing called Folger Singles, uh, which they recognized that people would want a cup of coffee and didn't necessarily want to brew a whole pot. So that was their first attempt to answer that consumer need. But you know, I would tell you that um, most people didn't think that was a great idea because I think. <laughs> Of what we produced, it was like going out with our employees back home because we couldn't sell it. Uh, they were like 15 years uh, too too soon. Yeah. But but the great thing about the Pringles is it's so compact. You could ship literally uh, all around the world from one spot. Um, you could nitrogen blanket the can. It was a fiber fold construction, so oxygen couldn't get in there very easily. Uh, it was you know it was much better than a big puffed up airbag, which is what you typically get your chips in. And uh, so they could ship you know all the way to Japan. Uh, from the Jackson plant. So it was 40 acres under roof, had 1,300 employees making over 35 million cases of chips when I left 16 years ago. So I have no idea how much larger they are today, but 
I, it, just to say it was a huge operation there. That's a, that's a lot of potato chips. Yeah, it is. <laughs> so the, uh, so the next question is, you know, I, I kind of wanted, I don't really know too much about this. So I want you to talk a little about the history of just Jack Daniels, the distillery. Like, was there really a man named Jack <laughs> yeah. Daniels? Like, I have no just, idea yeah. without anything. Yeah, just shed a little history just about, about that and the brand itself. Okay, first of all, there was a man named Jack Daniel. Actually, uh, Jack was his nickname. His name was Jasper Newton Daniel. I uh, was born here in Lynchburg and never knew his mother. Uh, was a young teenager when his father died of pneumonia. So he found himself orphaned at a very young age. Uh, he ended up moving away from home and ended up on the the neighbor who was a farmer. Uh, he was a Lutheran minister. Uh, he also owned the general store on the square, and it was on that property that Jack learned how to distill whiskey. Uh, and he kind of perfected the craft uh, on on this uh, man's name. His name was Dan Call. Uh, he was out there for several years, and then he had the opportunity to purchase the distilling equipment. And when he did, he brought it to where we're located today. About what time era was this? What, what were the? You know, yeah, we're we're still uncovering um, some of the details of our history uh, as far as who was, you know, the actual person that he learned how to distill from on the Call Farm. Uh, we believe it. Uh, we've gotten recent data that's pretty much pins pinpoints that it would have been uh, a man named Nathan Nearest Green, uh, who was a slave at the time. Uh, actually, uh, Nearest Sons were some of the first uh, distillery employees, and the, the Green family still works here even today. Uh, but, you know, starting in the eight, late 1860s, mid-1860s, uh, out at the Call Farm, and then ultimately ending up here at the Cave Spring in the 1880s. Uh, so we've been here for a fairly long time. Um, but I, what, when I think about what would have driven Jack to have come to this location, I'm pretty convinced it's the quality of the water. Um, you know, we have a, a cave spring that flows with abundant limestone water. It's cold. It's what that's only in Kentucky limestone water, right? <laughs> no, you know, the limestone, yeah. The limestone Ridge kind of begins up near, uh, Virginia comes through Kentucky and then terminates close to where we are. No, no, it's just funny. Everybody here, they're like, our limestone water is what makes it. And I'm uh, like, yeah. it's in a reverse osmosis machine. <laughs> well, I, we don't do anything to our water other than just kind of get the particulate out of it um, up through fermentation. So we know that the, the quality of the water definitely is, is vital in fermentation. Um, as soon as you distill, it, it doesn't really matter where your water would come from. You do need to uh, use distilled quality water um, because you just want to, you're not necessarily creating character at that point. You're just trying to preserve it after the after the distillation column and through the barrel. Uh, but nevertheless, you know, we think Jack came here in the 1880s. Uh, not sure exactly what date it is, but we've been here for a long time, and I'm, I'm convinced the, the water was was one of the main drivers that brought us here. And uh, but you know, he's as an orphan, only five foot two when he was a full grown man, so he was not a real tall guy. Uh, but starting out making medicinal whiskey for a Lutheran minister to be sold here in the local general store. Um, Jack Daniels has grown to become the number one selling single label of whiskey today. Uh, and every drop still made right here in Lynchburg, you know, a town that only has one red light. And, uh, and like yeah, I said, if, if you don't make whiskey, I don't know what you do. Yeah. So like, you know, in Kentucky, there's tons of distilleries. Like, or it was, I mean, is, was distilling a thing in Tennessee or is Jack Daniels like, I mean, you hear Dickel and Jack Daniels, but is it a thing like it was here back in the day? Yeah, because we have so many <laughs> defunct DSPs that are out there yeah. and things that were lost to prohibition. So kind of talk about that. Uh, sure. Yeah, that you history. Know, yeah, if you if you go back in history, back before uh, prohibition here, there were dozens of distilleries that were all located in this area. Uh, the, the county where we're located is the second smallest county in the state of Tennessee. It's called Moore County. Uh, both by geography and by population, it is the second smallest. Um, but the charcoal mellowing process has been given the title of the Lincoln County process because uh, before Moore County was built, uh, Lynchburg, the community where we're located, was part of Lincoln County. Uh, they, they passed legislation in the early 1870s in Tennessee that said if any community was more than a day's ride by horseback to a courthouse, that they were going to build a new courthouse and create a new county. Uh, so. Pretty much anywhere you're standing in the state of Tennessee, you shouldn't be more than about 20 or 25 miles from a courthouse because that was roughly what they, I think, were figuring. It has something to do with or the topography and how hard it was to get around uh, by horseback. But before the days of highways and cars and things like that, they were trying to connect the, the state together so you could do business. And courthouses were pretty much where every, all the legal business would be conducted. 
So Moore, Moore County was literally constructed after the whiskey distilleries were already up and running here. Um, our courthouse was built, I think it was finished in 1874, uh, the one on the square. Yeah, I was about to say, but, I was like, with all those courthouses, like, what kind of delinquents are running out there that you got to <laughs> have this many people? That, now you now you said business purposes, I get it now. Yeah. Yeah, you know, you didn't have a lot of attorney's offices where you could go and sign legal documents and get them notarized. So everything happened at a courthouse uh, back in those days. So they started adding courthouses and making it easier for people to do business and get legal documents signed. So, uh, but there were dozens of distilleries around uh, Lynchburg. They were all taking advantage of the of the cave spring or the, not the cave spring, but the limestone springs that exist here. Uh, we do have a lot of uh, limestone springs in the area. None of them are as big, uh, I, I think, or as high quality as this one. And I think that was kind of Jack figuring out if he was going to be serious uh, as a whiskey maker, he needed to get himself a decent water source. Uh, so he purchased this property and that's where we still are today. Where, when did, I guess, Jack, make its mark or when did what made it what was its turning point you know to make it a national known like with jim beam it was like the war you know they, they were sent to when did jack become like you know jack daniels okay uh you know i, I think there have been a couple for us and the first one would have been in 1904 uh and that was when jack traveled to st louis to the world's fair the world expo of whiskeys and uh he got voted world's best whiskey gold medal uh there and uh, so he actually won that one himself. That was before Jack passed away. And then he continued to compete um, after that. We, we don't put Jack Daniels into many um, whiskey award type things anymore because I think so much of that is just trying to make a name for your brand. And uh, Jack Daniels has already got, I think, 98 or 99 percent brand awareness. So, you know, very few people that are of drinking age who haven't heard of Jack Daniels at this point. Uh, but yeah, I would say that in 1904, uh, the first gold medal uh, would have been a turning point to put Lynchburg and the Jack Daniel distillery on the map. Uh, the other one, I think from a pop culture standpoint that made Jack Daniels more of a household name would have happened in 1955. And that was when Frank Sinatra held it up on stage and said, ladies and gentlemen, this is Jack Daniels and it's the nectar of the gods. <laughs> and our sales doubled the next year. We went from selling, we were still a small regional whiskey company in 1955. Uh, but we went from selling 150,000 cases to 300,000 cases uh, from 55 to 56. And it put us on allocation for the next 25 years. So we literally could not make enough Jack Daniels until the late 70s, early 80s. And it was at that point that Jack Daniels became an export brand. Um, and now we're in 170 countries. So I thought you were going to say Animal House, you know, the pop culture. Kind of. <laughs> <laughs> you know, some of those some of those things, you kind of love them and hate them at the same time. You know, yeah. I guess that was cool, but oh, no. <laughs> yeah, I was <laughs> like, I wonder how much they pay to be on that. Yeah. <laughs> like, probably, not, probably not as much as you think. <laughs> yeah, yeah I'm, I'm not sure we should be sending cash to any Jack Daniels when she's brushing her teeth with it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. And so it was kind of funny that you said that you really didn't or, or actually started to catch up with the uh, the production cycle in the 70s and 80s. And that was the time when the bourbon community wasn't really doing too well. You know, when clear spirits were uh, yeah. were actually, you know, king at that point. And as you had mentioned, that's when the export market really picked up. So I guess it was a, a time that you all could start building stock once again. It, it was. Yeah. The 50s, 60s and uh, 70s were certainly kind of brown spirits. That was their heyday. Uh, began to cool in the 80s, 90s, and 2000s. And then I think kind of has began its uptick around 2010. Uh, the last five, six years, for sure, you've seen a lot more whiskeys coming into the marketplace. Uh, you know, rye, rye whiskey in particular is the fastest growing form of American whiskey today. Uh, and you're seeing a lot more uh, labels of that showing up in the market. So, yes, during the 80s, uh, we, that was when we began to come out with different expressions of Jack Daniels. That, you know, we came out with Gentleman Jack during that time frame to uh, to double mellow, to kind of use the the innovation and the craft of of charcoal, and to and to apply it to the product in a way that would kind of potentially make it a little bit more approachable, uh, a little bit softer, a little bit more delicate, uh, for what was at the time uh, a palate that was asking for lighter flavors. Um, we followed it up, of course. Then we came out with something in the in the 90s that was the polar opposite of that, going with single barrel for for those hardcore, you know, the diehard Jack Daniels fans who said, hey, we really would like something more interesting, higher proof, more aromatic, more flavorful, um, coming out with single barrel to kind of answer that. And really didn't do a whole lot of new flavors, uh, you know, or different variants of Jack Daniels. Uh, so 1997 to 2011, we came out with no new products other than just some collectible series 
type things that the, yeah. that the collectors always ask for, but we're now up to 10. So you can tell that just, you know, since 2010, 2011, uh, the whiskey market has been on fire. Uh, and we have certainly been trying to respond to the fact that people are looking for uh, new and interesting things to try. Cool. So I guess now's the time. Let's let's really dig into um, you know why why is Jack Daniels a bourbon or or not a bourbon, and we'll get <laughs> we'll get your opinion after this. So let's so I'm gonna I'm gonna put a few check boxes out there and see if see if we're hitting them. So uh, is Jack Daniels being distilled in the mash, and does it use at least fifty one percent corn? It does. Yes. Check. Okay. So check we check box <laughs> there, right? Um, and you had mentioned earlier about the water. Uh, you know, having it from the cave spring and that gives it uh, something, you know, another another flavor additive, I guess you could say yeah. to it. Uh, I've also read somewhere you guys are very proud of your yeast. Can you can you talk about that in the in, in the regards of it, too? Sure. You know, we um, very similar to your what I would call your old school um, distilleries. Uh, we maintained a jug yeast here that was just a, a very diverse mixture of yeast that had been harvested from this hollow uh, over the years. And I would say People have asked me, you know, what things have changed or what things have gotten better about Jack Daniels over the years. One of them is in our ability to, to, to care for and manage a live yeast culture. Uh, we've been able to go in and, and kind of clean that, uh, you know, a, a yeast is sort of a population. It's uh, not everything in the uh, in the, the culture is going to have the exact same properties, but you can select for properties. But you want to maintain character. Uh, and get rid of all the things that are maybe wild, any lactics, any acetobacters and things like that. Make sure you have a pure culture. So we have done that, but we do, we have a proprietary yeast culture. Uh, it's only used to make Jack Daniels. It's preserved here and in two other locations. So we cryogenically preserve it to make sure it doesn't change over time. Uh, we're constantly monitoring for character, uh, any shifts in character. Um, our, our superior alcohols are, you know, if we run a GC analysis of, of our distillate, um, if we see any shifts in it, we can go to the freezer and pull up a culture that was, you know, the mother culture uh, and resurrect that and, and get ourselves, you know, right back on uh, target of, of the character that we want to have. So um, we also have other uh, uh, proprietary cultures within our company. And we also cross preserve those uh, here for those sites, just in case something were to happen at our other distillery sites and we could provide a clean culture back to them. So we try to, we try to, you know, share and, uh, back one another up where we can, uh, but we have a full-time microbiologist who um, actually wrote the the yeasting section of the alcohol textbook. So I would say not only is he an expert for Jack Daniels, but he's considered to be pretty much an industry expert as well. You know, in my business, when they say you know we're, we back each other, but we call that disaster recovery. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah we, we have disaster recovery plans for sure. <laughs> I, I, I to talk about Jack Daniels and disaster in the same sentence. <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, you know, we already talked about Lynchburg, right? So distillation in the United States. So that's another checkbox, right? Yep. Yep. Um, and it kind of follows a, a lot of the other laws that would require it to be bourbon, if I'm not mistaken, meaning that you're, you're not adding any flavoring agents, um, distilling at no more than 160 proof, entering the barrel at no more than 125 proof, right? Correct. Yeah, we distill at 140 proof. Um, for most of our entry, it's going to be at 125, but we have gone as low as 100. Um, so based on what we're trying to accomplish in the barrel, we can, as long as we don't exceed 125, then we meet the letter of the law and, and right. we never exceed 125. Right. And then, uh, and then, okay. So you had talked about the Lincoln County process already, uh, but give a little bit more description and detail of like really what that means and charcoal mellowing type of charcoal, like where does it come from? All that good stuff. Okay. Um, we only use a, a hard sugar maple variety of wood, and that's going to come within about an hour's radius of Lynchburg. Um, today, we used to operate our own sawmill to cut the wood, but today we just find it's much more practical to, to partner with local sawmills who, who run saws all day long uh, to go ahead and, and, and create a rick of wood. So these are about roughly two inch by two inch sticks that are four feet long. Uh, there's 343 of them. Uh, stacked in a sort of in a, in a crosshatch grid uh, in, in multiple layers, uh, which allows us to to bring them in and, and store them here on site and guarantee some amount of seasoning. So we uh, we purposely have open storage, uh, you know, as far as out in the elements, because we do want the, the rain and the sun and the winds to, to kind of take some of the green elements out of it. Uh, then ultimately, once the hard sugar maple has 
has cured uh, and, and seasoned some here on property. Uh, we can put four of them onto a pad and light them up. Uh, and we'll use our own product um, as the accelerant for it. So we literally go out with 140 proof whiskey from our own steel, uh, put a lighter to it and create almost like a blowtorch to get the, the ricks hot enough to burn. Uh, but ultimately, you know, burn through the wood. Um, as soon as all the open flames are kind of gone from the wood where you just see glowing embers, we'll put uh, water on it to quench it and put, put it out and let it cool. Uh, once it's cool, we'll grind it down to about a quarter inch in size and then hand compact it into a 14 foot tall vat that holds a 10 foot column of charcoal. Uh, so it's all done here on site. Uh, like I said, the wood is all local. Uh, there's certainly an art form to how you burn uh, and make charcoal in the open air. And what you want to do in your vat is uh, you don't want the, the particles to be so fine that the whiskey can't flow through it because literally you can just blind it off uh, almost like silt if you don't grind it correctly. Uh, but what you do want to do is make sure that you don't have big coarse particles in there because what you're wanting is is contact. You want the, the whiskey to make a lot of contact. You want it to get exposure to, uh, you know, this is this charcoal is sort of like a carbon filter. It will have receptor sites in it where it can absorb things from the from the whiskey into itself. So that's a lot of people, we, we say that charcoal mellowing sweetens our whiskey and a lot of people think because of its hard sugar maple is the wood that somehow wood imparts a sweetness to the whiskey. But actually what the, the charcoal does is it absorbs bitters into itself. Uh, so it alters the flavor as the whiskey passes through uh, and it, it lets the sweet flavors pass and it pulls the bitters off. Uh, it takes the fatty acids out of it. Uh, slightly uh, adjust pH back up towards neutral because your distal is, is acidic. So uh, what the whiskey that flows in the top of a charcoal mellowing vat uh, is, has sort of a, a slightly oily mouth feel. It feels like it clings to the tongue. Uh, and when you swallow it, it has an aftertaste that I would describe as like corn chips or cooked corn. Uh, but it shows up in the bitter zone, which is in the back of the throat. Uh, and then days later, if you taste the distillate that's coming out the bottom of the vat, it's very clean, light, and sweet, but very much on the tip of the tongue, which is where the sweet zone is located. So uh, we allow people to do actually those two uh, samplings on different tours here, uh, where you can taste our distillate before charcoal mellowing and after. Uh, before is, in every regard, uh, a bourbon. Uh, there wouldn't be any exceptions. The only thing you would need on that to complete the the picture would be a new charred oak barrel, which is what we do. Uh, that would be the last checkbox uh, that you would need. So it's just this one additional step that we're doing uh, that we feel like makes us different. And, and I can tell you a little bit more about the history of, of, of bourbon and Tennessee whiskey in the eyes of the Federal Alcohol Bureau, too. <laughs> uh, well, let's let's touch on that here in a second. But I, I kind of want to just scoot back real quick to the, you know, the actual charcoal filtering itself. So you said that it takes days to filter out through, right? I mean, that's I, when I when I heard that, I was kind of like, oh, what's it take like an hour or something? You said <laughs> yeah. it takes days. Yeah. No, it'll take days. Um, the vats, we have 72 of them. Um, and we're flowing at about 60 gallons, I would say on average uh, a minute. So each vat uh, that we have in service, some you're always taking vats out of service to change the charcoal out, drain them out, wash them out. So it's normal that we're going to have about 60 to 65 vats in service of the 72, um, but you're going to flow at about a gallon a minute uh, into those vats. They're, you're constantly flowing in, you're constantly flowing out. You'll have to turn those vats over uh, several times to actually displace everything in them. Um, what we have studied in the past is that um, a carbon absorption model, uh, typically whatever is going to be absorbed is going to happen in about 12 hours. Um, so that's the, you know, if I had to get down to the the nitty gritty uh, of how much time does the whiskey need to be in a vat uh, to get um, the magic worked on it, it would be around that length of time. But what we've learned is that, you know, I don't know that 10 feet is necessarily the perfect amount of charcoal, uh, but I would tell you it's a good amount because it gives the vat life. It means we don't have to go in there and constantly change out the charcoal because, uh, you know, it's, with charcoal being similar to a sponge, you know, when a sponge gets full, the only way to make it useful again is to wring it out, you know, once it's saturated and full. Uh, there's no way to do that with the charcoal. Uh, and if you would imagine when a new charcoal mellowing vat goes into service, most of what happens to the whiskey happens within those first few inches of charcoal. Um, but over time, that, that surface layer will begin to get saturated and it won't be able to hold anything. So the whiskey will have to work its way further through the vat uh, before it will find charcoal that can kind of work the magic 
uh, that it needs to. So over the course of the, of the life of a VAT, we recognize that there's this line that's going from the top to the bottom uh, of what is active charcoal versus what is saturated. And you just don't want to hit the bottom of the, of the VAT. So we're, we're tasting every VAT that's in service every week, um, checking to make sure that what's coming out the bottom doesn't taste like what's going in the top. Uh, it, it noses differently and it tastes different. And uh, so, but we're not uh, leaving that to chance. Now we have a hundred full-time employees who serve as tasters in addition to their normal jobs. And about half of that 100 do nothing but before and after charcoal mellowing um, sensory work for us. It seems like a mm. highly inefficient process. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, and that's probably why a lot of people quit doing it. I uh, gave up on it years ago because, you know, it was the Lincoln County process. Uh, and that meant that all the distilleries down here kind of use some form of it we're known for. Uh, we came back up after prohibition and continued to do it. Uh, very few distilleries in this area came back up after prohibition. Uh, but Jack Daniels had built a reputation off of it. I do think that it makes the, you know, whether you're a Jack Daniels fan or not, it makes Jack Daniels unique. It makes it different. Uh, and for a lot of people, it makes it their favorite, uh, which is why I think we have such a loyal following with Jack Daniels today, because uh, it, it's distinctly different before and after charcoal mellowing. Uh, it wouldn't. It just wouldn't be Jack Daniels if it wasn't mellowed. So let's talk about some of those regulations, right? Because when, when I look at the the entire scope of the checkbox, right, it hits every checkbox to ever be labeled as a bourbon, right? It's it's bottled at at least eighty proof, um, you know, American made, new charred oak whiskey barrels. So I don't. I mean, if I think about it, like there's there's this big spin of craft movements that are happening as well, and they could definitely do something with the new distillate before they go and put in a new charred oak barrel. Um, however, you know, you guys want to claim this as uh, purely Tennessean or whatever it is. So I kind of talk about the what you said, the, the regulations and the federal regulations between what you're doing to be called bourbon, your particular take, if you want to go ahead and okay. put yourself on the line, too. OK, sure. Um, if we um, after prohibition, you know, Tennessee actually started uh, its prohibition period about 10 years before national prohibition. So we went dry in 1909 when the nation did in 1919. And then when the nation lifted it in 1933, uh, Tennessee stayed five years longer uh, and didn't overturn it until 1938. And that was largely due to the lobbying uh, of the Motlows, uh, who were the nephews that Jack had willed the distillery to. So they went to Nashville, you know, actually ran for office uh, and won a seat and went to Nashville to lobby to get the distillery and, and state uh, prohibition overturned. So once we were back up and running, uh, we were entering the marketplace, I guess, in the around 1941. Uh, this would have been uh, Green Label was our biggest seller back in, in those years. So it was, you know, it's a less mature uh, version of Jack Daniels. So they were able to start reintroducing some products from the distillery back into the marketplace. And uh, they uh, had the back then it wasn't the BATF and it wasn't the TTB. There was a uh, Federal Bureau of Alcohol that existed in Washington, D.C. So they wrote the Motlows and said, look, we have reviewed your process and there's no exceptions to your process. Everything that you do there uh, qualifies you to be called bourbon. Uh, therefore, we would like you to change your label to not be called Tennessee whiskey, but to be called bourbon instead. So the Motlows at the time, the, the nephews contested that and they said, look, you know, our uncle said that that Tennessee whiskey was different by virtue. Not it wasn't called charcoal mellowing back then. They 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 referred to it as a process called leaching. Uh, we leach it through charcoal. And they said, you know, it makes the character so different that we believe that, that Tennessee whiskey is different than bourbon. And we don't want to mislabel it because we think it tastes different. So to settle the, the dispute, actually, they traveled to Washington, D.C. And they took the before and after versions of our distillate, showing it what it tastes like off the still and what it tastes like after charcoal mellowing. And they did a comparison of the other bourbons that were being produced out of Kentucky at the time. And they wrote us a letter. And this was dated December of 1941, where they said, We've tasted your product and we, we agree uh, that you don't have the character typical of bourbon whiskey. Therefore, we will not contest your label any longer. Uh, so they allowed. So the Motlows literally took a stand uh, for Jack Daniels to not be called bourbon, even though in the eyes of the federal government, it qualified. Because they said, hey, we're spending a lot of money on this process uh, of charcoal mellowing, and it's been an integral part of who we are. And we don't want to back up from that. You know, it does. It adds days to our process. We spend over a million dollars typically buying wood and replacing it in our process. So 
Uh, we don't view it as a shortcut or I've heard uh, of a lot of different things that I think have sort of derogatory um, uh, implications as when people mention charcoal mellowing who don't do it. Um, but we would tell you that we think it gives us a nice head start uh, of getting rid of the bitterness in the distillate before we ever get into the barrel, because that is one of the things that the barrel was designed to do for bourbon. Uh, was Of course, it was to soften its bitter edge, but to also to gain all the other things that it would you know, benefit from in the barrel. But we feel like, hey, it's what the barrel would take probably a couple of years to get done. The charcoal can get done in a couple of days. Um, so let's not stop doing that because it, it creates a unique flavor for us. So it wasn't just a Kentucky versus Tennessee thing. We're Tennessee and we're more proud. No, you know, I, I think it was, you know, I think Ken, Kentucky had already built a reputation, even though you can make uh, bourbon in any state in America, by far, Kentucky is the one who embraced it and made it famous. And when people think of Kentucky today, they think of horse racing and bourbon. You know, I think when they think of Tennessee, they think of music and they think of, of Tennessee whiskey and, and, and it being maybe slightly different. Uh, but of all the things in the whiskey world, for sure, our, our closest, our first cousin in the whiskey world is bourbon. Um, so if you go down through our process, we can check every box of bourbon. It's just this one additional step that we do that we feel like gives us a unique uh, character uh, that, like I said, Jack believed in that the Motlos fought for uh, to keep in place. Uh, and then ultimately ended up uh, as part of a law that was enacted uh, about four years ago in the state of Tennessee that defined Tennessee whiskey for uh, as a category. Yeah, but I think that's but that's also not like a federal regulation, right? Like bourbon's at a at a federal level, so you can have Mississippi bourbon, you can have New York bourbon, of course you have Kentucky bourbon. Now I think, right. and of course, you know, you guys hit all the check boxes that you're te it technically is a bourbon. You do a little bit something extra to it, but you want to call it a Tennessee whiskey. So what if uh, somebody in California wants to go ahead and uh, get a truck bed full of charcoal and start? you know, filtering his, <laughs> his distillate out of there. And they're like, well, Tennessee whiskey in California. This episode of Bourbon Pursuit is made possible through listeners like you supported through Patreon and with partnerships brought to you by the following. Are you looking for a brand new idea for dad this year? Or maybe just a sweet gift for yourself? You know, we've talked about it on past episodes that cigars and bourbon are a match made in heaven. But figuring out what cigars you enjoy can be an expensive journey, especially when it comes to figuring out the sticks you like, owning a humidor, the maintenance, and much more. That's all changing because the Good Cigar Company is here to be your own personal tobacconist. For $30, you get everything you need for enjoying cigars with your bourbon. The Good Cigar Company makes it simple. Just pick a strength level and they send you top shelf cigars at a great price. But it's more than just the sticks. You get everything you need to light those bad boys up including a cutter. And if you don't smoke often, don't worry, because the pack acts as its own humidor so the cigars stay fresh for months. Go check out Good Cigar Company at goodcigar.co and use promo code BOURBON for 10% off any subscription and begin the patio season with a good bourbon and relaxing smoke from Good Cigar Company. Sterling Cut Glass is the official whiskey and tasting glass supplier to distilleries across the country and is also the official glassware of Bourbon Pursuit. Sterling has contracted with the finest European crystal factories to bring the best quality glassware into their Kentucky warehouse and production facility. If you've been following us on social media, you'll see how their deep etched glassware is truly the best in the industry. I know because I searched up and down the internet to find out who was the best. Come to find out, Sterling Cut Glass supplies almost all the distilleries on the bourbon trail, and they are also the official glassware of the PGA Tournament and the Kentucky Derby. Make your logo shine on Capita Nosing Glasses, Glen Cairns, Neat Tasters, Rocks, Tumblers, and more. They are offering free etched samples to whiskey societies nationwide. Simply email spirits at sterlingcutglass.com, include your logo, and mention Bourbon Pursuit. Take a look at their online catalog by going to bourbonpursuit.com and clicking on the banner for Sterling Cut Glass. It technically is a bourbon. You do a little bit something extra to it, but you want to call it a Tennessee whiskey. So what if uh, somebody in California wants to go ahead and uh, get a truck bed full of charcoal and start you know, filtering <laughs> his, his distillate out of there? And they're like, well, Tennessee whiskey in California. 
Well, part of, part of that is the federal codes also say that you can't claim a geographical distinction that you don't really have. Um, so if you call yourself Kentucky bourbon, it needs to have been within the confines of the state, um, likewise for Tennessee whiskey. But uh, what our law established was that it, what you needed to do more uh, than just be inside the state of Tennessee to declare something a Tennessee whiskey. Uh, and Cause not every whiskey that's made in Kentucky can call itself bourbon. And, and Kentucky kind of had the foresight and understanding that the word Kentucky adds benefit to a bourbon label. Uh, you know, it has the reputation for making great bourbons. And uh, so there is a state law that, that besides the federal code further defines what a Kentucky straight bourbon is uh, because they didn't want people driving a tank or a bourbon through the state of Kentucky and calling it Kentucky bourbon just simply because it had, you know, ridden I-65. Uh, <laughs> So, and, and likewise, same, same for Tennessee. Yeah, we, we felt like we didn't want people necessarily shipping GNS uh, into the state and then finding some little nuance uh, in the codes that allowed them to declare that a product was made in Tennessee if it wasn't. Um, but there were some old historical newspaper clippings that went back until the days, uh, besides Jack Daniels and George Dickel, uh, one of the, of the old uh, whiskey sellers, manufacturers that was in the state of Tennessee was Charles Nelson. Uh, and his great, great grandsons, Charlie and Andy have resurrected the brand. They were in Greenbrier, which is just north of Nashville, but uh, they found these obscure uh, newspaper articles that talked about uh, Charles Nelson, who actually was a much larger distiller than Jack Daniel uh, back before 1900, uh, but talking with Jack Daniel, talking with George Dickel about actually making a law that would define the charcoal mellowing process or the Lincoln County whiskey process uh, as a legally defined product of Tennessee. So they they were even thinking about it years ago um, that they said, hey, this is something that's unique and distinct about the state of Tennessee. And maybe it's something that's worth protecting. You know, Scotch. So George Scotch, Dickel does this too? Does the, they do. Okay. And everybody does it. Yeah, everybody does it a little bit differently. Um, you know, if you look at their process, I'm not sure how often they find that they need to change out their charcoal. I don't know that they ever say. Do they call it the Lincoln County process also or? Uh, yes, I believe if you look at their his, their records, they're, they're doing it for the same reasons that we are. And it was because okay. it was a regional uh, phenomena here that everybody believed that it made whiskey taste better, made it uh, more palatable and easier to drink if you did it. Uh, but if you go back in their history, they talk about they had a distiller many years ago who said that he felt like charcoal mellowing worked better in the winter. Uh, when the distillate was colder, when it would go through. So I'm not sure, you know, what science they had to support that, but it was just a sense that if the whiskey's cold, the charcoal is more effective. Therefore, they go through like a chiller uh, to make sure it doesn't matter if it's winter or summer, they get their whiskey good and cold before they go through the charcoal mellowing process. And that's sort of their, their innovation or their take on how to get the best out of charcoal. You know, for us, it's 10 feet. It's tasting it every week. It's changing it out as necessary. Uh, to get what we want out of it. And I would tell you that Jack Daniels is pretty aggressive. Uh, I'm looking at other distillers. There's 33 distillers, I think, now across the state of Tennessee. Um, 30 of them came in in the last six or seven years. Um, but some of them are just using maybe, you know, a foot or two uh, of charcoal and they're flowing fairly slow. Uh, but I, I've told people, I said, you know, you need to decide what's right for you um, to do it. But by keeping it, it, it kind of allows, it gives you one more talking point about your brand. Um, that, that gives you a tie to the history of, of Tennessee and, and the charcoal mellowing process that really was the one unique thing that Tennessee brought to the world of whiskey. So w while we're on the topic of, of legislation and stuff like that, uh, back in 2014, there was a, a, Tennessee, a Tennessee law that was going to be uh, invoked or modified or anything like that. Uh, or maybe, sorry, it was back in 2013, uh, that uh, was going to allow the reuse of oak barrels in the Tennessee whiskey aging process. But you oppose the legislation. Is, is that because you secretly love bourbon? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I, I would tell you this, you know, when I describe Jack Daniels to people, you know, the first thing that I have to do is talk them through our process and explain that we are, first and foremost, we're a bourbon. Uh, and one of the things that I love about bourbon is that they're all natural. You know, by, by keeping a, a brand new barrel, uh, as part of the requirements, it guarantees that you don't have to use colorings or flavorings or, or things that other uh, products that are produced out of used barrels have to rely on uh, just simply so they don't pale either in flavor or in look uh, to bourbon. So, you know, being all natural, I think there's just a lot to be said for that. And, 
So, uh, you know, if we were going to define something as a Tennessee whiskey, I wouldn't have wanted the definition to have come up short uh, of bourbon. You know, to me, that was sort of the, the basic starting point is that, you know, why, why would we want to legislate something in uh, that is a, a pretty well unknown compromise uh, when it comes to, to whiskey making? Um, let's keep it all natural. Uh, that's historically what we've we've done. If you know, if the industry gets to the point where there's pressure because of wood supply, uh, that we need to rethink that. You know, we shouldn't be doing it at a state level. We should probably be talking about that at a national or, you know, or federal level for what defines bourbon. If if we're going to say, hey, we're going to take some of the pressure off of the new wood supply and we're going to allow you to refurbish barrels, then I think we could talk about it. But you know, Jack Daniels makes barrels. You know, we're we're part of a company that and bourbons, but also as a new barrel maker. So I think our understanding of the barrel may be a little bit better than than most whiskey makers today because we're so vertically integrated that we we buy our own logs, we have our own stave mills, and we have two cooperages. And uh, we have products that we reuse barrels in. We have Canadian whiskey, we have uh, Reposado tequilas, uh, we have a Kentucky whiskey uh, that's allowed, you know, by its definition to reuse barrels. And from what we've seen, it's just I don't know that you can do anything to a used barrel uh, to have it fully replicate the, the benefits of a new barrel. Uh, to me, it's sort of like a, a tea bag. You know, the first time you use it, you get a lot of flavor and color out of it. And you can try to reuse a tea bag a second, third or fourth time, uh, but it's simply not going to perform uh, on those subsequent uses the same way it does on its first. So with that, you know, at, at this point, I wasn't wanting to compromise with it. I don't see any on the wood supply at this point that would dictate that we would need to do that. So yeah, I argue definitely for the fact that I think Tennessee whiskey should, should hold the line uh, and keep new barrels as part of its process. By the way, I think we just caught you in there that you just said that Jack Daniels is a bourbon, right? We caught you <laughs> well, saying. Yeah, yeah, of course I did. Cause I mean, <laughs> that's, that's the first thing I have to establish is that our process follows the bourbon um, class and type that there's no exceptions there. And that bourbon is, uh, is a quality distinct, uh, you know, distinctive category. Uh, it's, you know, it doesn't allow artificial colorings and flavorings. And, uh, you know, ha there's some truth in labeling that follows uh, being able to put bourbon on your label. Not all whiskeys can call themselves bourbon because bourbon is, uh, is a little bit higher form um, of whiskey uh, as it's defined. So I, I always try to establish that first is that Tennessee whiskey is actually a, uh, a unique form of bourbon. Uh, that's made in the state of Tennessee and utilizes the melon process. Yeah, it's just funny. It just seems like they would have they would have come up with some better name than just you know Tennessee whiskey, mm -hmm. right? Because you could say whiskey can be whiskey, it can be really anything, but you know it could have been a a Tennessee bourbon whiskey, or you could have made just use the word whiskey backwards or something, and be like that's <laughs> that, that's what we are, right? Like I don't know. I think you know I would think that if if. Jack Daniel thought that we were still going to be debating it 150 years later. <laughs> yeah. He probably would have come up with a whole new name for it. Uh, but you know, whiskey, whiskey was a common term back he then. A hundred year strategic plan. Or, you know, <laughs> you know, we we have seen um, some of the old newspaper articles back when when whiskey was being sold. When really, uh, it was largely being traded at a commodity level. Um, so the brand name, whether it be Jack Daniels or Nelsons or uh, Dickel whiskeys or whatever, it, those were not as important as the Lincoln County whiskey title was um, because all the whiskeys that were produced using charcoal mellowing were kind of lumped together uh, and marketed as a unit. Like I said, when, when whiskey was really almost seen more on a commodity basis, it's like, okay, here's bourbon, but here's Lincoln County whiskey um, if you're looking for it. It didn't really matter what brand name it was. Gotcha. So when we, you know, you had mentioned like, you know, he probably should have thought of this. And I guess the question to you is like, why do you think the general public even cares if it's categorized as a bourbon or Tennessee whiskey? I mean, is it because people like us, we have too much time on our hands and we want to, <laughs> we just want to we overanalyze everything these days? Well, you know, I, I think it, whiskey is one of those things where, you know, I, I liken it to vodka. You know, does it really matter where your vodka is made as long as it's pure? You know, you, you can argue over who tastes least uh, and, and that's more important yeah. than maybe where it was made. But when it comes to whiskeys, there's so many different variants. And I think the location that it's made almost sets an expectation uh, in your head that, you know, Kentucky bourbons are going to taste like this. Scotch whiskeys are going to taste like that. Canadian whiskeys will taste like this. And Tennessee whiskeys, like I said, kind of have their own distinct character. Um, 
low, a little bit lower in rye as a general rule than Kentucky bourbons, and then charcoal mellowing kind of really brings the sweetness forward. Um, so I, I think that that becomes important because whiskey is more a product of its place than maybe any other distilled spirit. Um, and people want to know these things about where they come from. Um, I, 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 I'm actually one of these that I'm, I'm kind of anxious to see uh, some of what's going on in industry right now where people are declaring distillery names uh, as trademarks that you don't even know where that distillery is, um, where there's a lot of buying and selling in bulk uh, and people labeling and declaring locations that are not necessarily, I think, being transparent or authentic about where the product was made and how it was produced. Um, you know, for us, of course, we make every drop for ourselves. So it's easy for us to stand and say, look, if it's got a Jack Daniels name on it, I can tell you where every drop of it was made. Uh, and that we don't buy in bulk from anyone. We don't sell in bulk to anyone. So if it's got our name on it, we did it. Um, and, you know, with the rye, in, in particular in the rye category right now, uh, there's just a lot of labels out there. Not many people making rye, but a lot of labels of it out there are just the same. Yeah, it all okay. comes from Come a somewhere yeah. in India. Yeah, right. It's the, just the state, <laughs> two states above you, one above us, right? Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, I mentioned at the very beginning of the show when we first started this, we have, you have this idea when people, they, you know, they, they hand you a bottle of Jack Daniels. They're like, that's not a bourbon. Like, get out of my face. Yeah. Or your son disowns yeah. them because they're drinking Jack yeah. or something like that. But does it go the other way around? Like, yeah. if you're in Tennessee and somebody brings you a... You're like, I don't want that Kentucky shit. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I mean, you're like, yeah, I'm a oh, Tennessee whiskey person. I mean, you kind of see that that flip side sort of happening as, as people start getting behind the brands or getting behind their state or something like that. You know, I, I think when it when it comes to, to Tennessee whiskey, you don't have a whole lot of options besides Jack Daniels today. You know, there, there's a few out there, but really, um, Jack Daniels largely defines Tennessee whiskey uh, with with its one brand. Uh, when it comes to Kentucky bourbon, I think you got a lot more choices. Uh, and if somebody's not a fan of Jack Daniels, you know, I, I sit with people, I do tastings with them. You can tell that some people, they absolutely love Jack Daniels. They're, they're you know, anxiously awaiting the next product to come out, but they're going to be a Jack Daniels drinker for their whole life. Others, you can tell, are kind of skeptical. They don't, they don't necessarily, um, yeah, I can tell that Jack Daniels, you know, they're going along with the tasting, but I can tell maybe that it's not <laughs> ringing their bell, you know, and that's, and that's fine. That's, you know, we, we as a company have, you know, we have um, several bourbon brands. They don't all taste the same. You know, so if I if I get a sense that people are not going to be a Jack Daniels fan, then I don't hesitate to uh, to point them to our Kentucky bourbon brands because I you know I've been through those processes. I know uh, the people who make them, and I know that you know I can give them a, a solid recommendation based on what I know. Uh, if the, if Jack Daniels isn't your cup of tea, just don't give up on whiskey. You know, go through. You look at look at Kentucky bourbons. There's some fine ones out there. Uh, do, you, uh, yeah. do you give him Chris Morris's <laughs> cell phone number and yeah. you're like, here, just go. go I try not to do that. And I think hopefully Chris doesn't hand mine out very easily either. But <laughs> yeah. but, but, I, but I know that Chris Morris is, is also a big fan of Jack Daniels, even though he's uh, sort of the mastermind behind our Kentucky bourbons. Uh, and I likewise, I don't I, from time to time, people ask me if I'm not drinking Jack Daniels, what do I drink? I, you know, I, I, I love Woodford Double Oaked when it came out. Uh, that was uh Company I was man. really stunned. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, I was. I was kind of stunned because when I saw the label, or you know, I had seen. Uh, the, when I think of double oaked, when I tasted that product, it wasn't necessarily. Um, you know, the, the, it was double oaked because it was in a second barrel, but the second barrel actually brings more sweetness uh, to to that bourbon than than I would have expected based on its name. So it was a it was a delightful surprise, and it's one of my favorites in that lineup. Uh, so yeah, I'm I'm actually a bourbon fan, and I I had drank more than just Jack Daniels. Jack Daniels was my favorite um, when I came to work here. That's why I was a Tennessee Squire. Uh, but I I can appreciate a lot of different brown spirits, and uh, I point people towards Kentucky bourbons all the time. I'm much more likely to to do that than to push them towards Scotch. Uh, there's only been a a few Scotches that I've tasted that I really would would say um, would be better tolerable. <laughs> yeah, that I would want to drink. I just, you know, the the smoke, the peat, the the iodine, the medicinal notes are not necessarily something that I find are wanting that I want to explore them very much. But um, you know, the sherried casks, um, scotches are the ones that I tend to to like the best. Um, and we we actually, as a company, just picked up three single malt scotch brands that I thought were excellent. I was pretty pleased, and I, they were very similar to the ones that I'd said would have been the best that I'd ever tried. Um, so. 
yeah, we've, yeah. we've become a little bit more of a complete whiskey company uh, over the course of the last decade. If you look at um, Brown Foreman and Jack Daniels going from just a North American whiskey uh, to really more of a global footprint. It really I, has. Yeah. I just yeah. had that, that, that happened to me in a conference in Florida with the whole Jack Daniels bourbon thing. Like I'm drinking bourbon at the bar and this guy I just met from Wisconsin. He's like, it's like, oh, I brought some good Jack Daniels up in my room. And I was like, uh, yeah, stuff, you know, put my nose in there. <laughs> <laughs> and so I went back to his room and I was like, I'll try it. Cause that it was, he had a bottle of gentleman Jack. I, I'm not sure which expressions or if there's multiple, but yeah. I had it and I was actually like, shit, it's actually good. I was telling <laughs> Kenny this a couple of weeks ago. And so I actually bought a bottle of gentleman Jack like two weeks ago. And I felt like I was like having an affair on my wife or something. Like, <laughs> like well, it's, nobody yeah, look at me, please. I'll keep your secret safe. Um, yeah. But you know we've we've come out recently with our uh, with our first full barrel strength product as a single barrel, and I and I think even people who've had a hard time writing anything positive about Jack Daniels over the years uh, were kind of taken aback at just how good it was. You know, somewhere well, between it, to me it was a nice change up. Like I drink we drink bourbon all the time, you know, and so it's like yeah. it's just like you said, it's got that little nuance that makes it different that stands out that that I, that I enjoyed it because it kind of gives a little different taste to your taste buds. When of course, you know, when I, when anytime with Gentleman Jack, um, if I if I see somebody drinking uh, Canadian whiskey in particular, you know, Canadian whiskeys kind of operate under a different set of standards, and they can use caramel coloring and some sweeteners and and things of that nature. Uh, but I think Gentleman Jack kind of comes off as as easily as approachable uh, as some of the best Canadian whiskeys out there. Yet it's still all natural. It's just water, grains, and barrel and charcoal uh, mm -hmm. getting to that flavor point. So I'm always like, if you if you're drinking you know, in the Canadian whiskey set, and you haven't tried Gentleman Jack, just maybe give it a look. Uh, so that's kind of my, my sales pitch to them. If I find somebody who likes the big, robust, the really dark uh, bourbon type products, I like our single barrel. And actually, I think our very best is our barrel proof single barrel. Like I said, somewhere between 128 and 138 proof. And I think it's just staggeringly smooth uh, at that high proof point because people usually look at the proof point like that and think there's no way I could drink that straight. And I always say, you know, don't don't fool yourself. The first sip of any bottle should be done neat. Uh, and then if you want to add a little water or ice uh, after that, then do it, but do it from a position of knowledge. Um, don't just look at the label and automatically assume that you know what you're going to do with it or need to do with it uh, to drink it. Um, you know, if you want to add a little bit of water after the fact, then by all means do it. Okay. So, you know, you had mentioned a few different brands right there. You know, we, we had talked about just the regular Jack Daniels Black. We talked about Green. We talked about Gentleman Jack. We talked about Single Barrel. talked about uh, Single Barrel Barrel Proof. So, you've, you've hit on a lot of different ranges of where people can come in. And so, I kind of want you to talk to some of the people like me, the bourbon snobs out there, right? Uh, and saying like, oh, you know, I... I want something that's, uh, you know, at least like 90 to 100 proof and, you know, something right. that's uh, bolder, fuller mouthfeel. Um, and then you've got those people that only want to go for rare collectible stuff. So, like, where where, where do bourbon drinkers, what's, what's a good medium entry here uh, for not just people getting into whiskey, but people that have been drinking bourbon for a long time? Like, how do they, how do they get themselves familiar with Jack Daniels? Yeah, you know, Anytime somebody tells me they don't drink much whiskey but want to try something from Jack Daniels, I'll suggest Gentleman Jack. And that's it's not that's not because I think that that's beginner's whiskey, because I know plenty of people who've been drinking for 30 or 40 years uh, and will tell me that that's their favorite from Jack Daniels. So, you know, a lot of people aren't beginning with it. They're ending with it. And that's just simply their preference. They like the softer oak finish that it provides. But if somebody tells me I do like brown spirits um, and I typically drink neat, um, you know, or just a little bit of water, but I really like to appreciate um, a whiskey for its own sake. I don't like to put mixers or anything in it to mask it. Then I would definitely push them towards single barrel for us. Um, to me, it's it's more aromatic. It's more flavorful. Um, you know, for people who say they like small batch, that they like to explore nuances, you can't get a smaller batch than a single barrel. You know, to me, that is the ultimate small batch and you get the ultimate variety when you do that. So for us, you know, a barrel will typically yield about 250 bottles, but it can be anything from I've seen 200 to 300 bottles uh, come out of a uh, out of a barrel. But, you know, assuming that you don't go back to the same store while they're still on the same barrel, you know, most most stores, if, unless they're buying a barrel from us, will just buy a case at a time, which is six bottles. So you can pretty much get a turn uh, and try a range of different barrels uh, with us. And I think 
for somebody who likes it, we, we do our very best internally. You know, there will be two experts that taste every single barrel to let it go to market. Uh, when I came here as the quality control manager back in 2001, that was the first product I was given uh, under, under my watch. I became the, the single barrel processing manager that put me on the master tasters panel. Uh, I became a huge fan of our single barrel at that point. And, and even though, you know, I, I inherited three products in the market, when I became master distiller, now I'm up to 10. I still kind of look at single barrel. The single barrel select is sort of the, my first child. Uh, and, and I definitely am impartial to it. I think it's fantastic. I think for somebody who is a bourbon drinker and really only thinks of Jack Daniels in terms of black label, and there's nothing wrong with black label, but if you're looking for more than black label, single barrel is going to provide it. It's going to be higher proof. Um, it's going to create more interest. I always say it, it can be really sweet or it can be really oaky, but I, I promise you that every barrel will be really something. How are um, you getting, how the hell are you getting 250 to 300 bottles out of one barrel? What's going on with the well, weather down there? <laughs> well, well, if you go, we have about a 30% angel share on that product. Um, so if you look at a 53 gallon barrel uh, going in at 125, you start with about 66 and a half um, gallons of whiskey in it uh, at a, on a hundred proof basis. So we calculate a 30% angel share, uh, go at 94 proof into a 750, it should net you around 250 bottles. But like I said, every barrel will be different. The warehouse location is gonna add uh, a nuance to that, but it's most importantly, it's its toast and char level. You know, we have a proprietary step we do on the barrel that kind of is designed to toast or caramelize the sugars and bring out the sweet notes of the, of the wood sugars. Uh, it's those two properties, the toast and char that will most influence whether the whiskey ends up in the front of the mouth, the back the back of the throat as far as the sweet or, or oak uh, levels on it. Or sort of a, I, I describe it as having sort of like a pendulum that swings. Uh, I describe Jack Daniels as being sweet to oaky in its range. Single barrel allows you to see the full swing of the pendulum. Gentleman Jack is very forward in the mouth. Old number seven is meant to be more centered up, being equal part sweet and oak, but single barrel, we just let it, let it swing. We, we put some out there that are like liquid candy that are very softly finished, that they're, they're still very high in character, uh, but we may have some that really don't have very many sweet notes, which you would normally uh, assume Jack Daniels would have. Uh, we have plenty of single barrels that are really much more oak driven, really dark, um, you know, a drier mouth feel. And in and of itself, you know, I don't think any of those properties are good or bad. Uh, it's about letting people uh, try for themselves and determine for themselves what the preferences are. And single barrel allows you the full, the full array uh, of different character that we can create. Yeah. And for anybody that is kind of wondering what that whole toasting process is, uh, you can check back when we had the Brown Former Cooperage yeah. on the podcast and we talked about yeah. all that. Um, yeah. The um, And then one thing that we didn't really hit on is the one of the guy, the guy that made you famous. So what's this whole uh, Sinatra release about with Jack Daniels? Yeah. You know, by making barrels for ourselves, you know, we did a pr the proprietary step of toasting. We kind of built um, a patent around how we do that part of the process. So all of our barrels are new and they're toasted and they're charred. Uh, but we had gone in and started to say, hey, if we just kind of cut some grooves in it, how would that change the uh, the maturation process of that particular barrel? We we could easily calculate that it would double the, the wood surface uh, to the whiskey ratio. So it doubles your inside surface area, kind of opens up three layers, your, your char layer, your toast layer, and your raw layer of wood immediately to the whiskey, kind of opens up the end grain. Um, the capillary action is going to be almost immediate on it. But most importantly, what's removed from the sides of the barrel stays in the barrel. Uh, when we were submitting that for approval, that it wouldn't declass it as a new barrel, we were thinking at the time that they would rule that we could do the process, but would potentially have to take all of the loose material out of the barrel. And likewise, it, it, they actually ruled just the opposite and said, hey, because it was a original part of the barrel, we'll let you do that process as long as it stays in the barrel. So literally, it's like kind of wood chipping uh, the barrel at the same time. Uh, even though we're not adding the wood chips in, we're just kind of creating them uh, by knocking them loose from the sides of the state. But we watched those barrels develop over the years. They year over year, about 40% darker uh, than the barrel that didn't have the process done to it. It's much bolder, much drier on the mouthfeel. Uh, so as we were, we were talking with, with Frank's children and they were saying, Hey, we would love to do uh, something with Jack Daniels. You know, he, he was a lifelong Jack Daniels drinker, literally from 1947 until he passed away. Uh, he even was buried with a bottle of it in his casket. So they so, you know, we wouldn't, we couldn't do anything with any other whiskey brand other than Jack Daniels, but we would love to do something and would like it to be different uh, at the same time. So 
the words that kept coming up were bold and smooth that Jack, that, that Frank was bold and smooth, uh, as a person. And we would want the whiskey to speak to that. So definitely what we call the Sinatra barrel, which is this toasted charred and groove barrel provides the boldness for that character. So those are brought in to the batch to kind of elevate, uh, the, the and, and lengthen the finish on the product. And I've had people come to me. We went back to 90 proof on that, which is the proof that he held up on stage in 1955. You know, it's it's if you look at the color, uh, I, I think the, the being darker and, and more oak driven in character would be much more reminiscent of the whiskeys of the 1950s than maybe of today. Uh, so we felt like it was just appropriate if we were going to take that barrel uh, and put a name on it that the, that the Sinatra name was the correct one for it. Uh, but uh, I've had people tell me that they've not necessarily been a fan of any Jack Daniels product until they tried that one. So I, I do think it's different. And uh, for some people, they tell me they don't like it. Uh, but all the more reason why we've gone from three products to 10. Mm -hmm. You know, ultimately what you hope to do is have something in your portfolio that if somebody who's open to drinking whiskey, they can find something in there that they'll like. I feel really bad for those people that thought that was the best one that they'd ever tasted because they got a, a pretty expensive stepping stone into whiskey. Oh, I, <laughs> yeah. yeah. See, my, my wife had always been a fan of Gentleman Jack. And um, we went and did a Sinatra dinner somewhere and she was asking me about that particular product. And she said, well, tell me about the Sinatra. And I said, well, I'm not sure it'll be your favorite because I kind of, I would plot it on the other end of the spectrum from Gentleman Jack, as far as its character, where Gentleman Jack is much more sweet, soft finish, not a lot of oak notes in it. This is much more in the oak end of the range, but it, that is actually her favorite. But, you know, after ring shopping with her and shopping for granite countertops, it wouldn't surprise me. <laughs> it makes sense. the most expensive thing in the store and make it her favorite. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> All right. So we got we got one more question to kind of wrap this up with. So uh, so right. Fred Minnick had a really good article about, you know, whether bourbon or whether Jack Daniels is bourbon. And he kind of he kind of closed it up. And I kind of want your thoughts that really this argument is going to always continue until the federal government ever steps in kind of defines it once and for all. So if the federal government were able to do that, would you uh, sit there and be on the, the, the lobbying board to make sure that you could put your stamp in history there? You know, we actually, before the Tennessee whiskey law went to a state level um, to be written, um, one of the things that we had heard from the TTB is that they didn't necessarily want to go in and tell Tennessee what Tennessee whiskey was. They were like, that's a matter for the state to decide. Uh, so, uh, you know, I think we're, we're fine with, with the way it ended up. And, and I think the debate, <laughs> I, I think the argument, the, all the debating, I think even, even though it was a painful time when we were arguing over whether or not there should be a Tennessee whiskey law, you know, I was, I was certainly happy that it stuck. Uh, but I think as people read through the arguments on both sides of the aisle, uh, even though I, it was largely, I think 90% sided with the fact that they thought the Tennessee whiskey law was, was a good idea and it would be good for their business. It, it gave them a, a definable process that they could sell a product under. Uh, they could choose to call themselves bourbon if they didn't want to mellow, or they could, you know, go to Tennessee whiskey if they wanted to. So they were like, Hey, that gives me two options uh, that people understand. Uh, so, I, but I think it's, that's just it. I think it's all in the understanding. Uh, it's all in the variety. And uh, so I think as long as people are setting out to make quality products, everybody wins. Um, it's just a matter of trying to, to do some amount of truth in labeling. You know, we, we feel like the, the more you can understand about how a product's made, I think the more you appreciate it. Uh, and in some cases, the more valuable it makes it, uh, both to the consumer that they'll say, hey, this is, this is the good stuff. Uh, I, I look at the label and I know what those words mean and I know the process by which it's made and this is good stuff. Um, and, and holds the manufacturers accountable to say, hey, if I don't do it the right way, I can't call it the good stuff. Um, so, uh, you know, I think if everybody accepts it on those terms, everybody wins. N not everybody in Tennessee has to, to use charcoal mellowing. Um, you know, it wasn't about trying to put us all in a box. Uh, and there are plenty of people who are not charcoal mellowing today who are uh, in the state producing um, products the way they want to. Um, but it was about trying to preserve some of the history of the state, you know, some of the heritage that charcoal mellowing was the thing historically that always made uh, Tennessee slightly different. Um, so that it's not where you can't just say, hey, Kentucky, Tennessee, make a choice. They're the same. <laughs> you know, I, I think I think it's actually good for Kentucky and Tennessee if we can say, hey, draw the line. And then now you've got choice. You can you can drink a Kentucky bourbon or a Tennessee whiskey and decide what you like best. Yeah, right. Bond that bridge, so to speak. <laughs> <laughs> so, Ryan, what do you think? Is is Jack Daniels a bourbon or is it a Tennessee whiskey? How do you define it? 
I'm gonna say Tennessee whiskey. It's funny. <laughs> I'm gonna say I'm gonna say it's a bourbon. So <laughs> I, I'm 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 with, I'm like with Jeff. Keep them separate, and you can choose you know whichever way you want to go. I'm gonna say I'm gonna say it's a bourbon, and but it's got, it's, got, it's got this it's got this this like tiny it's like it's like an M M&M, and M, but it's got this like tiny candy shell around it, right? Yeah. That makes it just a little bit different, right? So. You know, what What I would tell you is I go into stores all the time and there's seldom, if ever, a Tennessee whiskey section of the store. But a lot of times they'll have their scotches separated and bourbons separated, Canadian whiskeys. If you're going to if that's the store format, we belong in the bourbon section. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the most popular right here. Uh, pre- preferably uh, at, uh, at eye height. <laughs> yeah, I bet. Yeah. <laughs> Well, Jeff, I want to say uh, thank you again for coming on the show today. If uh, if people want to see you in work and kind of see you doing your thing, like what what could what were some uh, some appearances that you they can make at the distillery or anything like that? Where can they find you? You know, I think um, I don't always know where I'm going until I'm going. Um, <laughs> I have a uh, I have a couple of trips. About half of my travel is outside the U.S., which reflects the fact that we're sold in 170 countries today. Uh, but I have an assistant distiller. We try to keep. Uh, either he or I out most of the time uh, trying to just educate people on how Jack Daniels is made and that we're real. Uh, let them ask questions and stuff like that. But our Facebook page is usually uh, pretty good to let people know where we're going to be making appearances uh, ahead of time. Uh, but of course, the best place to find me, 80% of my time I spend in Lynchburg. Uh, so if people are in the Nashville area, it's only an hour south. Uh, it's a beautiful drive down. We're giving tours all but four or five days of the year, which are the major holidays. Hey, I'm coming down to Florida and I pass Lynchburg on the way. You do it. Yeah, you know, we're, we're a dry town, which means we don't have any liquor by the drink. So there's no bars or restaurants that can serve alcohol on our square. Um, but we have, so bring your own. <laughs> <laughs> but, but we bring have the right. Yeah. The, the, the laws have changed uh, over the years and every, every brewery, every winery and every distillery is allowed to do a sampling tour of their facility. As long as it's hundred percent site produced. Uh, so we have two different tour formats that include tastings. Uh, so you can you can try our high end range of Sinatra and gold and barrel proof and rye. Or you can do what I would call the flight of Jack, which is sort of the, the gentleman Jack, black label, their honey fire uh, in that range. So uh, but based on people's interest level and what they normally drink, we have two different tour formats to support that. Uh, but that's the best place to find me. Eighty percent of my time. I'm right here in Lynchburg and uh, I always consider it a privilege to, to stop and shake people's hands when they're on tour. Awesome. Well, Jeff, I appreciate it. This is uh it's been eye opening for me, yeah. uh, especially, you know, we were, I'm a bourbon snob, like, don't get me wrong. Right. Yeah, so it was, de- it was definitely an eye opening <laughs> situation. And I, I, I learned a lot more than I thought I was going to learn. So it was, uh, this is very, very good for me. Yeah. I, I totally agree. Kenny is a snob, but uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm hoping, you know, Bourbon's great, and I'll, that'll be all my always my go-to. But I'm always interested in trying other things, so I'm hoping our listeners and stuff will kind of put their like loyalty to bourbon aside and you know give Jack Daniels a shot. Go try the Jack, well, I, Jack the single barrel, something like that. Yeah, yeah. You know, I, I'd be the first to tell you I think it's fantastic that Kentucky is is as bourbon loyal as it is. Uh, but you have a lot of you have a lot of Kentucky or bourbon fans here in the state of Tennessee for sure. Um, I don't automatically expect that somebody just because they live hometown um to drink jack daniels and, and and many of them tell me that they have a bourbon that that's their favorite but just you know choose choose a quality product make sure you know where it's coming from who's making it and, read uh, the label right <laughs> yeah, it's all, yeah, yeah. i don't know if that's you're, a, you're playing by the rules of the book right the, the laws yeah. are right there right so listen to bourbon pursuit read the read the bourbon blogs they'll give you the the straight skinny <laughs> that's right well sounds good so if you like the show make sure you subscribe to us on itunes you can support us on patreon p-a-t-r-e-o-n.com slash bourbon pursuit and make sure you follow us on all those great social media channels facebook twitter and instagram at bourbon pursuit ryan go ahead and close us out yep and if you have any show suggestions feedback comments we love hearing from you all uh because sometimes we always run out or not always but we and run iTunes out of, reviews and itunes, itunes reviews, reviews yeah we give us a shout reviews. out um because that helps people find the show more easily. But uh, yeah, we just love hearing from the, sh- the fans and hear what they want to hear so we can bring it to you. And uh, we'll see you guys next time.